think we should communicate our results. This is a fundamental part of science. Make others aware of what you have found and, and do it with uh, enough detail that can be reproducible and that somebody, if necessary, can go back again, in our case in astronomy, to observe the same object and then draw the same conclusions or, I mean, criticize what we have done. This is also, I mean, the, the critical part of, of science is as important as the, I mean, positive results. So both of them should go together in the uh, publishing process. Spitzer told me once that uh, he, he only consulted the Astrophysical Journal and never looked at the European journals. Um, uh, I don't know why it's not so difficult. But it was true and the people in Europe felt that. This paper was withdrawn, I can see. I think if you write up things in a publication, it allows you also to, to close a project and it allows you to make all the results you have really hard. At the moment you publish, they are hard numbers, they are there for somebody else to check. I thought it was an excellent idea to have a European journal because uh, I think in all countries in Europe we have been fighting to, to get the adequate recognition from our international colleagues, especially across the Atlantic. And uh, ANA was uh, certainly a, a chance from the beginning. So you arrived and it was a pile of new papers. And uh, you know what? I liked it. I always had a feeling of anticipation, arriving, you know, which discovery am I going to find today, which... Uh, instead of saying, oh my god, it's, no, that, that's what I like the best. Astronomy and Astrophysics, a European journal making its appearance with this issue merges a number of astronomical journals of long standing. Annal d'Astrophysique, founded in 1938. Bulletin Astronomique, founded in 1884. Bulletin of the Astronomical Institutes of the Netherlands, founded in 1921. Journal des Observateurs, founded in 1915, and Zeitschrift für Astrophysik, founded in 1930. There was in the Netherlands a, uh, a journal, it's called the Bulletin of the Astronomical Institutes of the Netherlands, the BAN. And, um, that uh, worked as follows. You had a couple of university institutes, they had a director, and the director could decide to publish a result in this bulletin. So the, the, the rule was that you published there, you, and my first papers were published in, in the BAN, the Dutch thing. Uh, but then Stuart Potters arrived in Groningen uh, as a young professor. When I came to the Netherlands in '63, uh, uh, I was made uh, editor of the BAN, uh, and it was clear at the time that uh, 
the BAN uh, had problems. Uh, it wasn't really a referee journal, so that wasn't good. The obvious journal for, for me at that time was the Zeitschrift für Astrophysik, uh, which was edited by Albrecht Unzelt, who was a world famous specialist in stellar atmospheres. And uh, he was the editor of this Zeitschrift. Uh, and uh, submitting a paper to him was really submitting him to him. He would take the decision, yes or no, no arguments. <laughs> I know people in the Netherlands at that time um, who, uh, uh, who, when they had an important result, or they thought an important result, they wanted to publish it in the Astrophysical Journal so more people would see it. That was difficult and that uh, uh, clearly indicated that something was wrong with uh, uh, the European journals. I think I have always uh, been aware that uh, important things appeared in other journals. I must say, especially Astrophysical Journal. It was in the unbelievable time that the physical journals came out every two months or three months, one copy, and then it was discussed at lunchtime about all the papers that were, that were in there. So there was, was certainly, in Groningen, there was a uh, lively discussion outside BAM. I talked about the problem with uh, Steinberg, and he felt also that the Analdus Physique would benefit by uh, joining a more European journal. Uh, so there was a, a basis for forming things. I think it was Orr who proposed that, uh, that Steinberg and I would be the first editors. First of all, we took uh, a strong interest in what was going on, and secondly, we both had experience as uh, editor. I followed the development of A and A from its very first beginning. At that time, 1969, and uh, Blau was the first chairman, the first president of the board of directors. The creation of astronomy and astrophysics results from the conviction shared by many astronomers of the countries involved that henceforth astronomical research will benefit from a joint medium for publication. The present step is a natural sequel to the foundation of journals on a national basis in some of these countries several decades ago. It may not be the last one in a worldwide development. It is the wish of the board of directors and of the editors that the new journal, by aiming at a high level of quality of content and conciseness in presentation, may first of all promote astronomical research in the countries represented on the board. However, the board and the editors will also welcome the submission of papers from outside these geographical limits, in the hope that a proper selection of these will contribute to the standing of the new journal. By introducing a low individual subscription price, it is hoped that astronomers and students on a large scale may acquire a personal copy of the journal. There will be a supplement series to the journal for the publication of extensive tabular material and catalogues. January 1969, Ablau Chairman, Board of Directors. When I started working in astrophysics, it was uh, 69, 
a long time ago. I did one year in the U.S. at the Goddard Institute in, uh, in New York, and my first paper was not with astronomy astrophysics, it was in a journal of chemical physics, I think, atmospheric, journal of atmospheric physics, and it was in English. But then I went back, uh, and, and my first, the first paper I wrote in France was for astronomy astrophysics, which had just been started. I felt probably not careful enough, and I thought it was easy to publish. So I submitted uh, by myself uh, a paper which was really not good in terms of science, nor in terms of writing, anyway. So, so the paper uh, was rejected very naturally, but uh, I had a nice remembering because um, the manager at that time was uh, Madeleine Steinberg, who was uh, Jean-Louis Steinberg's wife. She didn't know me, but uh, she sent me a very nice message uh, telling me, well, your paper has been rejected, I'm sorry about that, but don't get discouraged and go ahead. And I was very much touched by that because I, uh, she didn't know me. And uh, for me, it was very important to have a, a, a good feeling from the editor in se itself. And I, I'm not sure it would happen again today. <laughs> My first papers, and actually I would say most of my papers during all my careers were published in ANA, I, with a few exceptions. Maybe I published half a dozen papers in total outside ANA in uh, the monthly notices or in, in the uh, astrophysical journal, but most of them were in ANA. And I remember these offices in the, in the premises in Meudon with uh, people helping the, uh, the scientists write their paper, putting them into the correct form. It was not the same uh, uh, techniques as, as uh, we have today. And uh, for example, we had to draw the, the figures uh, by hand many, many times. And uh, we had uh, persons who were helping the scientists doing this kind of job. This is a circulation slip of a, a paper. This paper has been uh, rejected, but uh, this was the old form. Uh, and this is the form we sent in triplicates to the, to the referee. No computer, no printer. Uh, we had to go down to the the telex machine or to the. We had a, a fax machine a little later, later on, and uh, we used uh, carbon paper uh, when we wanted our letter to be in triplicate, and this was often the case. We did our best to, to send them in the comments, the referees' reports, as soon as we get them, because we know that the authors are very anxious uh, about their papers. So we did our best to send them uh, as soon as possible. It was very simple. You got a paper, you read the abstract, you uh, glanced through the text, see what it was about, you tried to understand the conclusions, and uh, then you thought, uh, who else is uh, doing this kind of research? And sometimes you picked from the, uh, from the list of uh, publications, you thought, well, he maybe uh, is a good man to ask. Uh, 
you also learned, of course, you get a, a network of people, some people who, who like to do this and did this very well and, fair, and others who always refused to do it. So you, at some point you, you dropped them from your list. But uh, I tried to look, the things I looked for was uh, independence, never try to find some referee from the same institute and preferentially not from the same country, but that that's, that was a loser, loser uh, requirement uh, but to uh, yeah to, to and I always also try to find uh, to mix uh, young people and very experienced people because sometimes young people uh, had a new uh, way of looking at things on the other hand young people are much more uh, intolerant and they uh, gave always they could give very very negative advice when you thought well can't be all that bad. And then you sent it to a second referee. We had suggestions to be more relaxed, especially for uh, papers from new countries like uh, Russia, like uh, China. But we rejected this idea. We said that they have to be judged in the same way as the other uh, papers of other countries, because otherwise the level of uh, science in this country will never be high enough if we lower the standards. But on the other hand, we did provide, for example, better translations, language improvements, and so on. Or we did give them free copies in uh, libraries that had difficulties in these countries, and so on. So we decided to have a high level of uh, standard, high standards for the acceptance of papers, and that was instructions that we were given to the editors. And this worked quite well. But I had a rule also that you should treat the, the referee uh, with respect. If the referee said no, uh, and you felt, well, no, that's, he's too strong, uh, that's, uh, that's not my conclusion. If I read the referee report, uh, then I sent it to a second referee. I said the first is too, too I don't believe him quickly. But I would inform the first referee that, he, uh, that I didn't agree with him totally. I was trying to look for a second referee. So I tried to be honest with the referee, but uh, I also felt I was independent of the referee. I had to take my decision. I have had problems with referees. He said, you should have turned, I said, you should turn down the paper and you didn't do it. And well, and I said yes, and I gave, and I, I, I don't give the arguments why I disagreed with his his opinion, and some were very angry about it. They they felt they were the referee. They had to decide about the paper, and I also thought, no, 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 it's the editor. He is the uh, the, the judge. The most satisfying part is the fight, the fight with, with the referee, when, when the fight is, is, a, is a fair fight. So you have your argument, the referee has his or her own, and then, and then you try to explain and justify your choices, your discoveries, and your, uh, your findings. And, and my, some referees might not agree, and, and again, I think this is a healthy part of, of the refereeing process. Um, and then this fight of convincing the referee that, that what you have done is has a I mean, solid basis and, and your results are, yeah, I mean, solid as well. Um, I think it's, it's a really satisfying thing in the end. During the process, it's sometimes really painful, <laughs> but in the end, it's really satisfying. And it's like, okay, this is what I deliver. This is my work uh, and I'm proud of it. So, so it, was, it, it, it remained a difficult point finding the, the referee that... Uh, uh, that that was that was that was the difficult spot, maybe the weak spot in the whole process. But there is no. I always felt there is no other way of judging papers. You have to do peer referee, peer refereeing, and peer refereeing is dangerous. There are risks involved. That's all true. But there's no other way you could do it. I think there is still um, 
a place in scientific publishing for peer review. But there are different ways in which one can go about it beyond the traditional model of one or two referees per, per article. Um, I think in the, in the short term future we, we probably would, would like to um, uh, keep the current model running at some level while exploring um, the advantages or disadvantages of alternative ways of peer review and community review and that sort of thing. Um, I think it's difficult to say exactly what ANA will look like in 10 or 20 years, um, but we hope that it will continue to be something um, um, that the community wishes for um, and, and respects as, as, as a journal that people aspire to publish in. If you don't publish, you're not known, you have no way to, uh, to disseminate your results, so publishing is essential. And I will add, publishing in English is essential. One of the reasons why people had initially resented to publish in English, if their mother tongue was French or German, for example, was their fear that they couldn't express themselves clearly enough and free correctly in the, uh, and, and thereby damage their, their papers. Um, I think both the referees and the officers uh, tried to help with this in cases where really necessary. Uh, I remember many referees who made minor corrections in the manuscript uh, to improve the English if necessary. This issue took a new turn when we received more and more manuscripts from Eastern European countries. This was of course intimately linked to the then ongoing political process. It was very welcome. Uh, but it caused uh, at least two little problems. Uh, one was that, uh, of course, the, East, the scientists in Eastern European countries had no way to pay pay charges as they normally would have had to do because they came from non-member state countries. Uh, but even more severe was that their ability to write good papers in English was very limited. At that time it was very, very difficult to, to publish because Romania was, uh, in, a, in a way, um, it, it was uh, uh, coming from, from a period on which uh, everything was locked. So difficult, difficult to communicate, difficult to have articles and also to, to exchange with uh, um, colleagues from, from abroad. So uh, it was a, a hard way to, to to, to find, to, uh, to learn how to uh, publish, how to um, write articles and also how to read articles for your science. So uh, for me it was uh, just a, a beginning. Many of the referees made even more elaborate language corrections than they had been making before. And at the tubing office, uh, I remember spending many hours uh, not rewriting completely, but changing a lot the sequence of words uh, that uh, the people uh, had uh, put uh, in their manuscripts uh, according to their mother tongue language, uh, which uh, has a different grammar and uh, therefore a different structure of the sentences, uh, etc. That was an interesting learning process, but also very time consuming. And I'm happy to see that there are much more professional solutions now. The 
vast majority of my work is to do with um, correcting, correcting English grammar issues and uh, changing around wording in sentences to make sure that the, the point, the scientific points come across clearly. Um, and then there's some work to do with making sure that the writing abides by A&A's broad style so that it's formal enough and that it fits with a kind of homogenous style in the journal so that it has a, an a and feel about it. And then there's another part of my work that is managing a team of freelancers who do the language editing work as well. Um, they work all over the world, um, so we've got uh, Native American speakers, Native British speakers, um, and people with different kinds of language backgrounds, uh, so that we can we all bring something different to the process, and we over technical language issues we can talk together and come up with solutions between us, which is a, a nice part of the work. It was no choice. We didn't want the level of English to degrade by introducing, by including these new manuscripts from a new, or from a new, uh, new group of, of scientists who for the first time really had a chance to make their work known in Western countries. When I saw um, Astronomy and Astrophysics as a, as a journal, I, I said that uh, this is very, very interesting because you can see through uh, astronomy and astrophysics also uh, the, the, the joint effort of uh, European countries in, 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 uh, in um, uh, um, let's say, uh, realizing a community, European community of researchers. And, and this is amazing. Yeah. Astronomy, astrophysics was and is important because it is the most European journal. You have others like Nature, Monthly Notices, which are not European. I am a strong believer in Europe. That's why I have always uh, supported astronomy astrophysics. When I was in the United States, uh, of course, uh, we published an astrophysical journal. Obviously, uh, we didn't think of anything else. And when I came to Europe, I'm trying to remember, I think some of the, very few of the articles is still published in Astrophysical Journal. At first, in the back of my head, I thought I'd be in Europe a few years and then go back to the US. And then we had a second son and uh, Diego was extremely happy and would absolutely not move for anything in the world. And so I got used to the idea that we were indeed staying in Europe. And I had this enormous wish to make Europe get closer to the, what I had seen in the United States, in every aspect. So of course, to me, space was a very important aspect and that's the one where I've put the most effort in my career, I mean, pushing Europe you know, together with, of course, uh, a very large number of very competent astronomers, but I think we have succeeded. And certainly now at ESA, which we are, we feel perfectly, now I'm, I'm chair of the Space Science Advisory Committee at ESA at the moment, and uh, I can really see what we are doing, what we have done, and uh, it's perfect, it's perfect. This must be set. Six, cinq, quatre, trois, deux, un, top. À l'image. Décollage. I felt strongly about astronomy and astrophysics very soon, I mean after a few years here and really wanted it to do well and was prepared to try to help it as much as possible. And of course, the other thing, and this is why I put my heart in it, ESO. And before the VLT, 
either was, you know, just another 3.6 meter telescope. Two, in fact, because of entity. But uh, there were many 3.6 meter glass telescopes all over the world. I mean, it was nothing exceptional at all. And so I was lucky that I was the director general of ESO when ESO emerged from being just one to becoming the principal observatory in the world. So that was a fantastic adventure, given my wishes. To go back to the journal, at the time we had no internet. And if you wanted to find an article, how did you do? You went to the library. If it was an article in APJ, you went to APJ. APJ published every few years um, an index over many years. And so in this index, you would easily find, by subjects or by authors, the articles you were looking for. And they didn't do that. It published in December an index of the year. So if you didn't remember the year, you had to take one out, it's not here, you had to take the other one, it's not here, or is it December? It took forever to find an article in the AMD, so I felt strongly that indexes were important. At the same time, I had this dialogue with the publisher, and I insisted on a pluriannual index. Well, I'm sure in the end I had to agree to pay something for it, but I obtained it. And uh, there has been one ever since. Of course, now it's not too important, so I don't know if they still do it probably. But uh, in those times, to me, that was a symbol of the differences between A and A and APJ. There was no five-year or six-year index. So. Most scientific research, most of the time, is what, what I think was bread and butter stuff. It's stuff you know needs to be done, it needs to be published, it needs to be out there, it needs to be archived, so it's accessible. And some of it is part of what's building up to something big, some of it is just background knowledge, and some of it may suddenly become really important 100 years later. In, in astronomy we get that a lot. Which is why, for example, there's a big push to find 19th century early uh, astronomical photographs and digitize them. So we see what did it look like 100 years ago. Yes, it's interesting, it's changed. Or something suddenly happens. It's like, do we have any old data on this? Do we know what it was like before? And that, that can be extremely valuable. The CDS, which stands for Centre de Données Astronomiques de Strasbourg, is a data centre for astronomy data. And we like to think of it as being for the reference astronomy data, the data that makes sense to have all together in one place to work as a kind of uh, reference. Uh, CDS has been here since 1972 and has a, a strong relationship with uh, ANA from the very beginnings of uh, connecting data to publications, uh, I think that the CDS and ANA have really been kind of pioneers about how you make uh, data connected to the publications available for astronomers not just to see but to really access and, and use and to download and to uh, support their science. Well, what we have here is a map on the sky showing the density of catalogues that are in the Vizier catalog service. What we can also do is, is take ANA, for example, and uh, look at the whole sky, all of the catalog sources that have been ingested at the CDS from papers published in ANA and see those as a, a mosaic map on the sky. And it gives you a different view on the scientific data that's been published in, in ANA. What we have seen over the last uh, decade, uh, dec decade or two even, is that the number of papers has gone up enormously. Uh, I cannot imagine that that increase will 
will go on because I, I think that at some point you you just reach a maximum limit of the number of papers people people can can, can actually write. Already today, when you look at the archive, there's tens of uh, papers per day. Well, not just in my field, but in the whole of astronomy, and it can be harder to catch up just because there's so much information. The original idea of the archive is that it is a preprint server. It is a draft of the manuscript before you submit it. That was the core idea. That get the get stuff out there early, get comments on it, get feedback, let your colleagues know what you're working on. Last time I checked, we were just under 1.4 million. We probably crossed that now. We get about 10,000 a month. And your average user can just go to the archive, grab a paper, and that's it. We're becoming more interdisciplinary. We don't only want to use tools that are developed in astrophysics for astrophysics, but we want to see what, what do biologists do. Maybe they have a clever idea to solve problems in astrophysics. And so this problem gets larger and larger. So we not only read astrophysics papers, but we also want to know about the uh, biology papers. And so I started uh, thinking, isn't there, with the growing uh, technology in AI, isn't there a possibility to do this? And so I developed a tool where you can give it a paper and just purely on content, it finds other papers. As a scientist, one has to find the balance to you know, how much time you spend per day to read about new sciences and new papers and how much time uh, yeah, you spend to do your own research. I think there should be a balance. The model of ANA is, is very much a community journal and um, uh, the board and the editors as well are, are very keen to make sure that we are um, uh, interacting with the community and we're giving back um, or we are changing the journal in, in, in ways that the community would like. Um, this can range from anything like you know making the submission process easier to providing statistics on turnaround times, that sort of thing. Um, and we're trying to make this as seamless as possible. Um, these might be small changes, but the cumulative effect um, is intended to be um, quite large as a whole. ANA is now an online-only journal, so there have been many changes that have been happening over the last few years. The new version of ANA, or as it will be in the coming years, is, is to seek to continuously improve uh, the author experience and also at the same time acknowledging all the work the referees uh, put into the process as well. There was some discussion even before I became chairman about online publication. I think uh, Tony Hearn uh, had a, a little committee that was investigating it and uh, uh, recommended of course that we should go online. And the political problem came with uh, electronic, electronic publication. Uh, we, we started electronic publication uh, f for tables in the supplement. Big tables and also big papers, which were really uh, very big pap observational papers like that. Uh, for since uh, internet was, uh, was developing, uh, why not having an electronic version of the journal? We all felt that, uh, well, partly we like to read it, we like to hold it. It was the psychological aspect. Uh, but there was also the part, um, the archiving part. Uh, and the archiving part is not to be neglected. I, I'm a little bit worried myself. Uh, how long will um, com computers last? How long will the hard disks last? And it's a, you have to keep updating it, keep on loading onto new things. Paper can last a long time. Uh, and, uh, well, we have papyrus going back to the Egyptians, you know, <laughs> except we don't write on papyrus anymore, but we do certainly have paper that goes back three or four hundred years. And uh, then I had discussion, I remember, of a meeting with uh, Elmut Haft, who was, uh, who was uh, the editor-in-chief of Astrophysical Journal, 
and also with John Schickshaft, who was the uh, editor of Monthly Notices, we had a meeting in Paris and we, we decided that we, we, should go, we should go along, all three of us. The Astronomical Journal was, was not represented, but, but uh, I think it, there was no problem on this side, uh, because uh, both American journals uh, uh, depend on the American Astronomical Society. And uh, the, was, the impulse was coming actually from the American Astronomical Society. So we, we decided we should go along, and then I contacted, uh, I contacted Springer, and, uh, who was the editor, and tell them, uh, I tell them that should, they should turn to electronic publication. And surprisingly enough, they, 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 they did, not, did not react. Uh, the, the person which was responsible for our journal in Springer was, a, was Professor Beigelberg, which was sympathetic to the idea, but he has no real power because Springer is a very hierarchical uh, company, you know, and uh, when any, anything comes to the bottom, it has to, to, uh, to go through many steps to go to the director, and uh, it, take, it takes a year to go back and forth. So it took, it took a year, it took a year to, 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 uh, to, to turn to electronic publication. And at that time, we were beaten by the astro astrophysical journal and monthly notices, because they, they, could, they, could, they, they could go faster. Because, the, of, of course, the, the journal, our journal did not depend of a, of, of a scientific society, but it, 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 it depended on, uh, essentially of an editor, of a private editor, and the private editor was not interested. So there was a clash with, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, Springer Verlag, and then uh, they were, they, the board decided to, to make an open tender for, renew, for, for the renewal of the, of the publisher, and uh, the winner uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, the Edip And Edip is still, as you know, is still the editor now. When we moved to, to them in, two, in 2000, that was, uh, they were really, they put a large team of people at the disposal of the journal. And uh, we, the, they were really listening to what they were saying. They were also, they, they also had uh, excellent suggestions on how to improve the journal. For example, put a, co put a picture on the cover. <laughs> This sounds, sounds, you know, small detail, but it's it's a huge, it, it has a huge uh, effect in the community because people want their picture to be in the front of ANA. &E. <laughs> it's great. So it, uh, it's <laughs> so they, they 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 make big, better pictures. They they, they send us their, their best stuff, and uh, that's that's how, that's how it works. for 100 persons by learned societies uh, and physicists are the, the major uh, shareholder and uh, the, 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 the position of EDP science governed by learned societies is uh, to partner the scientific communities so we are made of scientists at the service of scientific communities. The company has been founded by uh, Nobel Prizes, including Marie Curie and different learned societies. And uh, at the very beginning of the company, there was Le Journal du Radium, where Marie Curie uh, was, uh, of course, our, uh, an author. ANA flipped to a pure electronic model two years ago now. I would say that uh, it was uh, completely logical compared to other journals and market expectations. So there was no real impact around that. And uh, EDP Science uh, was a pioneer in terms of electronic. Uh, since the first journal website has been launched in 1995. Mm -hmm. I know from my own experience that um, online is, is fantastic, you know, uh, we get summaries from ADS of the papers that are interesting and just click on it, up comes the whole paper, but I don't read it, 
on there. If the paper is something around the Galactic Center, print button. And away it goes, chuck, 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 chuck. Because I still want to read it. I, I don't get uh, this kind of uh, um, complete feeling that I see the paper when it's on the screen. I can't leaf through it fast enough. I like to have it uh, on a piece of paper. At home, I have a huge bookshelf with all the astronomy, astrophysics that when I was on the board and the chairman is on. My wife wonders, what are you, how long are you going to keep those? I said, well, when I go, they can go, but not until then. <laughs>
my student on a philosophical basis, look, you shouldn't publish just because you have to publish. You should wait until you have something serious to say that will... You don't need to publish 10 papers. One, very good, is sufficient. And then it will come back to me and say, well, this doesn't work. I mean, I go to a job application. There is a, another interview with a student. I have one paper, the, student, the other student has 10. You killed my career. So I can't do that. Ideally, I would like to. In a sense, I, I think it's not even enough nowadays to publish only because people will not read publications to the same level as they could read them 20 years ago. So in a sense, it's not just only publish or perish, but it's, it's also publish, advertise your work or perish because just putting it out as a publication, to me at least, often seems not enough anymore because it's not picked up. So you have to distribute it via emails, even ASOPH is not enough. You put it in newsletters, you, you go to conferences to put up talks and posters and get it into as many review talks as possible. Because publication alone is not even winning your positions anymore. I mean, that's my personal feeling, but maybe I'm too pessimistic in here. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's gotten to the rather extreme now. And I wish we would actually manage to steer the boat around into a slightly different direction. So the excellent journal is one of the four uh, main journals, uh, general journals in astronomy, and it, is, it has grown uh, as expected. Uh, it's, it's really up to, the, up to the same standard as the three, the three competitors, you know. So, uh, no, it's, it has really uh, fait son trou, comme, comme on dit en français, makes <laughs> take, to, uh, take, take on its, its, its place. Welcome to ESO, to all of you. For us, it's a pleasure to host the ANA uh, board uh, in our premises. Uh, we've been together for 50 years. This is a very remarkable milestone. And I'm just going to be very short on this, but my overall message is that we're really very happy and very proud about this, this partnership. And we really hope that it can go on for another 50 years, to say the least. ANA is a different journal from the others and in fact if we if we take a look it's it's remarkable it's the only main astronomical journal that does not belong to one organi organization or country it's in fact uh, the only truly international journal it's a consortium of sponsoring organizations from 25 countries uh, not European anymore it's, that's an historical fact now we have countries from outside Europe I had excellent contacts with the with South American uh, astronomers and uh, we managed to convince uh, Argentina first and then uh, Brazil and Chile to join the, the journal. Uh, and that was uh, that was an opening to the to the South American world which was very uh, very very nice. We're trying to build this identity of the journal for, for this many countries uh, and that is not just European, no, it's European, Latin America, in Latin America there are not as many countries doing astronomy, uh, but it will be very important for, for to, to build an, ide an identity that is a big continental identity, maybe even more later on, and of a journal run by astronomers for astronomers. So there is the Bulletin of the Astronomical Society of India, but uh, by and large, a lot of Indian astronomers will also publish in ANA and MNRAS and APJ. So these are common mechanisms too. So I think uh, as an astronomer, wherever you are, I think these are journals you do publish in. And it's nice that we have so, so few journals finally. The, the physicists are completely lost between the enormous number of journals and, the, uh, and it's, it's become a, a real headache. For us, there are not many, and you can really uh, hope to see what is important for you in, 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 in the, the, the journal you now. Because astronomy, uh, the community is very small. There are something like uh, maybe 12,000 12, professional astronomers in the world, not more.
everybody here at Paris Observatory is very happy that the offices of the managing editor are in our premises and we, we intend to keep that, of course, and uh, to provide as much support as we can uh, for the uh, edition of this fantastic journal. We are a really small team here at the office. It's, uh, it's uh, um, uh, nice to have uh, various skills. For example, uh, uh, my colleague has a more uh, uh, skill in documentation, and uh, so I don't think we would need to be uh, uh, two uh, with a PhD in astronomy, but it's useful to have one and other people who have other skills and, uh, because we can uh, be really complementary. I'm really grateful to be able to, to help in this process and, uh, and to, to work with the community and uh, people are all really kind and, uh, and it's nice. <laughs>the need to combine data that come from different times, from different telescopes and different messengers that are coming from the universe, not just the photon, but gravitational waves and neutrinos and particle showers, uh, all of that uh, combined together. And I think that's driving a kind of innovation along with the publishers, because it's the science that's reported in the publication, which is uh, what we're really heading towards. Uh, and we hope that our reference services and tools become kind of part of that. DT activate. Continue project center of the galaxy. Now apply orbits with Einstein. One of the theory. dreams I have is I want to build a machine that you can ask questions to, and it will know the answer because it has access now to all the world's literature. To all it says there were 10 papers in the last five years, and three of them said the answer was X, and there were two of them that said, like, you know, the answer was Y, and there were a couple of others that had totally other ideas about this. And it will also be able to tell you, oh, in computer science, someone made a new method that might be applicable here. So I think having an AI research assistant would be a tremendous opportunity for us. And I'm very excited and I think that this is possible to do. We should not close our minds and say, okay, now we are moving into a, a di different kind of media. Maybe the, the papers will not appear in print anymore. The formatting will be 
God only knows what in the future. So although I tend to I, I tend to like going to the library, open a book, smell it, and you know see that other people have already seen it and see the, the, the underlines on it. I love that, but also I think that you know we need to move on. We can't stop that. There will be new ways of expressing ourselves and disseminate our findings. Now everybody say ALA. <laughs> Now everybody jump at the same time. <laughs> 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 <laughs>